Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. This is the first lecture on two-dimensional incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. Let us recollect that when we were discussing about the one-dimensional advection diffusion equation, we assumed that the velocity field is known to us by some means. So, we did not try to solve for the velocity field, we go ahead, we uh, make certain assumptions that the velocity field values could be of this range and we try to work out how advection diffusion works in a combined manner. So, that is what we did in the advection diffusion equation case. So, now we discuss the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations where we do not assume the velocity field ad hoc, but we rather try to derive it by making use of the governing partial differential equations involving mass conservation and momentum conservation. So, we would look at continuity equation which ensures mass conservation and we look at uh, the momentum conservation equations in a multidimensional problem there could be several components of it which we would have to tackle and then we find ways and means by which the velocity field is actually solved. So, we have to obtain the velocity field in this case by solving the governing partial differential equations ensuring conservation. Now, in Navier-Stokes equation, what do we do? We try to represent time dependent velocity field which evolves due to several effects. We already have discussed about advection and di diffusion. Now, in Navier-Stokes equation perspective, we talk about advection, diffusion which comes up in the sense of viscous effects and we talk about the effect of pressure gradient, which we did not bring in when we were discussing about advection diffusion equation. So, pressure gradient will be a major driving term in solution of Navier-Stokes equation. Now, there could be more effects which can come into the solution, but we would keep it simple and we will just include the advection, pressure gradient and viscous effects to find out how there is a time dependent solution of the velocity field. When we talk about velocity field, we automatically also talk about the pressure field because they have to be solved in unison. You cannot keep them uh, uh, away you cannot keep them isolated when you solve for the governing partial differential equations. So, we will find ways in which uh, they are solved in a simultaneous manner. Now, when we solve incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, we are actually solving the compressible Navier-Stokes equations which is a wider framework involving compressible flows and uh, looking at compressibility of the working fluid in a certain limit where the Mach number tends to 0. So, we are essentially talking about a very low speed scenario and the other way of looking at it is that the sonic speed becomes infinite. Therefore, disturbances take no time to propagate into the entire domain. This we have seen earlier when we were dealing with elliptic partial differential equations for example. So, the compressible Navier-Stokes equations can be reduced to the incompressible form and here, we are going to solve equations of motion for a homogeneous fluid in the absence of body forces or chemical reactions or mass diffusion. However, those effects may also exist in more complicated problems. For example, body forces may exist, a very common example could be say gravitational force when you are handling working fluids which are rather heavy or dense, you cannot ignore such body force there may be other body forces also arising uh, 
may be electromagnetic forces which vary from problem to problem. Now, they have to be accommodated as additional momentum sources that means on the right hand side of the Navier Stokes equation. Again, if you have the fluid composed of various chemical species with mass diffusion or chemical reactions, you have to account for additional conservation laws for ensuring conservation of such species. Inhomogeneity in the fluid med medium may also have to be tackled and they may arise very widely in multiphase flows where you have more than one phase to be tackled and there are fluid interfaces which may be moving around with time and evolving with time which have to be both defined and tracked in order to demarcate the different regions of homogeneous fluids with their own individual properties. Again, all the while we assume that the working fluid is a continuum and this usually happens when the length scale of the problem is significantly large than the mean free path of the working fluid molecules and for a very large number of problems this is satisfied. However, for certain problems it may be violated example when you are looking at rarefied gases uh, this may be violated or if you are looking at problems which are of minuscule length where you actually go into the molecular levels and you can see the molecular length scales in the problem itself. In that case this continuum uh, hypothesis may be violated, but for a large number of problems of engineering and practical significance we may still be able to go ahead with the continuum hypothesis. So, these are some of the things we have to keep in mind when we discuss about incompressible Navier-Stokes equations and to keep things simple we have uh, confined it to two dimensions here. Though a very large number of practical world problems are three dimensional, but extending the two dimensional to a three dimensional scenario though non trivial uh, may not always involve a very large difference in terms of the fundamentals. So, it may be more amount of bookkeeping, more amount of complications of implementation, larger computing power and so on, but fundamental issues more or less remain the same. So, if we discuss two dimensional incompressible flows uh, using Navier Stokes equations, we should in principle also be able to extend it to three dimensions without much effort. Now, the fundamental equations of fluid mo motion which are of importance to us of course, are the conservation of mass which will come up through the continuity equation, the conservation of linear momentum or the Newton second law the momentum equations and conservation of energy which is essentially the first law of thermodynamics. Now, many a times when we say Navier Stokes equations we generally talk about the momentum equation. Some of the scientists prefer meaning both the mass conservation as well as momentum conservation as Navier Stokes equation. So, it works both ways. For incompressible flows the energy equation essentially is decoupled from the continuity and momentum equation. So, you do not really need to couple it up with the first two. However, you are if you are still interested to solve transport of heat for example, in a problem where there could be an issue of temperature distribution to be solved by using energy equation, then it can be computed sequentially after you have solved for mass conservation and momentum conservation in a decoupled manner. So, once you have the velocity and pressure field subsequently you can solve for the energy equation and then you would obtain the temperature distribution. So, it is essentially a one way communication. Now, depending on the formulations again different numerical schemes have to be applied suitably. So, that we able we are able to couple the velocity and pressure in incompressible Navier Stokes equation one of the major challenges is that that when we talk about mass conservation we talk about divergence of the velocity field equal to 0 and then we do not see the existence of pressure there. Neither do we see density which can act as a common connection between momentum and continuity equation. So, momentum and continuity equation get decoupled in a way. So, pressure which exists in the form of a gradient in the momentum transport in the momentum conservation equations very much influence the evolution of the velocity field. However, that same pressure 
which is so much responsible in evolving the velocity field figures nowhere when it comes to mass conservation. So, that is the paradox and that paradox has to be resolved by suitably coupling the velocity and pressure fields. And this is one of the major issues in incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. We are trying to find and learn methods by which we can actually get them coupled and attempt numerical simulations after we get them coupled that way. Now, using compressible Navier-Stokes equations from that perspective could have helped because they are strongly coupled. Density is a common factor which runs through all the governing uh, conservation equations, but where does it turn out to be less efficient? It is found that when you try to apply the Mach number tending to 0 limit in the compressible Navier-Stokes equation solvers, they become computationally very expensive and sometimes also very prone to numerical instabilities. So, there are very special preconditioning procedures which are required to even uh, get a solution with great difficulty from such solvers at the in the low Mach number limits. So, it is not a very efficient way to do that and therefore, there are dedicated efficient algorithms, algorithms which have been developed to compute incompressible Navier-Stokes equ equations rather than trying to do it from the compressible Navier-Stokes equations perspective. Now, two dimensional incompressible Navier-Stokes equations are mostly solved by using two different formulations. The first is what is called as the primitive variable formulation which is expressed in terms of pressure and velocity. Why we say primitive variables is because these parameters pressure, velocity can be very easily physically connected with problems, with problems which exist around us and therefore, they are variables which are uh, physically connectable and that way they exist in a more primitive manner. All right. While if you try to derive certain parameters out of these primitive variables, we can have schemes which are based on derived variables. So, the second approach is actually dependent on such derived parameters which are vorticity and stream function. Now, these are parameters which are dependent on the velocity field no doubt, but they are not directly connected with the velocity field. They are dependent on its gradients and it is not always very easy also to physically figure out how variations in their values are physically connected to a particular problem. However, from a mathematical perspective bringing in such derived parameters like vorticity and stream function is very useful in devising this second approach which is called as the vorticity stream function formulation or approach. So, we will learn about that approach as well. However, it is found that this approach works fairly efficiently in two dimensional flows be it planar or axisymmetric because the concept of stream function is essentially two dimensional. However, if you try to extend this approach to a three dimensional scenario, you would actually have to bring in more complex vector potential concepts which could be rather complicated to implement in comparison with the primitive variable approach and therefore, when you try to solve a three dimensional problem, you would generally prefer to use primitive variable formulation over uh, the other one. So, here because we are dealing with two dimensional flows, we do not have any particular preference, we would try to learn both of them and both of them can do equally good jobs. There are pros and cons of course, to both. Again, in any one of these formulations, you can use the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations in either dimensional or non-dimensional form and they can as well be used in conservative or non-conservative form. Depending on the kind of numerical algorithms you are using, sometimes you make suitable choices of this. Non-dimensional forms are often chosen for engineering applications because if you solve for a certain value of a non-dimensional parameter then that one solution can fit into different physical scenarios where the dimensional values may be different, but incidentally the non-dimensional parameter value still remains unaltered. So, that way non-dimensional solutions are better amenable for engineering applications. Again conservative versus non-conservative sometimes is linked with the kind of schemes you are using. The conservative 
uh, formulation is most often used for finite volume formulations, while I while non conservative forms are easily applicable to finite difference formulations. Of course, finite difference formulations can as well work with conservative formulations. So, there, there is flexibility here and there, it is not very hard and fast and rigid that you have to necessarily associate each one of these forms with particular uh, ways of discretizing the equations, but these are the usual guidelines. So, to begin with the primitive variable formulation and different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations. So, we have made blocks which indicates different forms like the block on the left is the dimensional conservative form and uh, it has been expressed again in a vector form or in, in terms of components. So, what you have on the upper half here is uh, in the vector form of course. And that is why you see that the uh, different components of the momentum equation have actually be represented, uh, have been represented using a single equation. Again, we have used the operator, operators, the vector calculus operators like gradient or Laplacian or divergence suitably on the different uh, terms of the Navier Stokes equations. And again, just to recollect. Uh, this is the continuity equation which is essentially divergence v equal to 0. These are the x and y momentum equations where uh, you have the unsteady term here, the advective terms here, the pressure gradient term which is usually on the right hand side again has been clubbed with this uh, one component of the advection term on the left hand side. And of course, these are the viscous terms associated with the viscosity coefficient. And as you can understand, Navier Stokes equation uh, the, the, the highest order derivative is 2 because of the viscous terms on the right hand side. This is somewhat similar to what you saw in the diffusion part of the convection uh, the advection diffusion equations. So, the diffusion part essentially involves uh, two applications of the first derivative, which means it is going to uh, arise second order derivatives. And because here this uh, coefficient is a constant, uh, the two derivatives work in succession on the velocity field and therefore, you have the Laplacian operator. So, this is how the equations look like in dimensional conservative form. Again, if it is non-conservative form, you have it on the right hand side and uh, you can uh, see that in the non-conservative form, the the derivatives apply on one component of the velocity while the other comes out of the derivative and acts as a coefficient, while here it was all inside the derivative. Now, to the non dimensional forms for uh, non dimensionalizing the equations, of course, you have to define non dimensional parameters for example, time when it is non dimensionalized you have to uh, generate a time dimension by introducing the u infinity by l. By the way the suffix infinity means free stream value that means values which are uh, existing far away from the sources of disturbances or perturbations in the flow field. Okay, far upstream of all the objects let us say which you have introduced in the flow field over which or through which you are trying to solve the flow field. right? So, that is what is called as the free stream and whenever we refer to free stream values we use the suffix infinity. That means, as though it is theoretically at an infinite distance from all the objects or sources of disturbances which are there in the flow field. So, if you check carefully the L by u infinity would end up generating a time dimension. And therefore, uh, this collection would give you a non dimensional time which he, we have represented as T star. Similarly, for non dimensionalizing the different length scales, we use uh, the uh, a particular uh, characteristic length scale of the flow problem. For example, if you are trying to solve uh, the viscous flow past a flat plate, then you would prescribe the length of the flat plate as the characteristic length scale of the problem. If you are trying to solve uh, 
flow past an airfoil, then the chord of the, that airfoil would become the characteristic length scale of the problem and so on. So, we need characteristic velocity scales here. Again, for velocities, the characteristic velocity and scale happens to be the velocity which is far upstream. Usually, if you are trying to look at uniform flow approaching your object of interest from far field and it is a horizontally oriented flow, then you would only have u component of the flow in that case. You would not have a v component. That is why we have referred to it as u infinity. right? And u infinity, vectorially speaking, may look as u infinity i plus 0 times j. It is something like that. Okay. So, u infinity is a suitable uh, velocity scale to non-dimensionalize. Again, pressure is non-dimensionalized by this collection of terms rho infinity u infinity square, which gives you the di dimension of pressure. And the most important parameter for viscous flows, Reynolds number, which is rho, u infi rho infinity u infinity L by mu infinity. So, you can see very well that the viscous terms have a coefficient 1 by Reynolds number on the right hand side and all the terms, all the dimensional terms that we saw in terms of unsteady, advective, pressure gradient or uh, second order velocity gradients for viscous terms are assigned with star quantities for the momentum equations and similarly, the velocity gradients for the continuity equation also have been assigned the star quantities. Again, the left block goes uh, with the conservative formulation and the right block for the non-conservative formulation. So, with these uh, few slides, I think we are becoming more comfortable with the form of the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. And what we had discussed earlier is clearly visible to us that the continuity equation deals only with velocity gradients. The momentum equations deals with velocity gradients as well as pressure gradients. So, unfortunately, pressure does not figure in the continuity equation, while it is expected to influence the evolution of the velocity field in a big way. So, that is one of the major uh, obstacles to be crossed before we solve incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. Now, when the Reynolds number is uh, fairly high, well over 1 in terms of few hundreds or thousands or maybe even millions. The time is non-dimensionalized like we have seen in the previous slide, that is T u infinity by L. Now, these problems where the Reynolds number is very high would mean that the viscous terms become weak, because you saw that the Reynolds number figured as 1 by R e times the second order derivatives on the right hand side of Navier-Stokes equation. So, as Reynolds number becomes large, that 1 by R e will become a very, very small value and therefore, the viscous terms will become insignificantly small, which means the solution is essentially a convection or advection dominant problem. Okay. So, in that case, this is a suitable uh, way of defining time, because the convective term or advective term which dominates over the viscous term uh, will mean that L by u infinity is a natural representation of the time interval for the problem, because the time by which a particle moves with free stream velocity uh, and is advected by a characteristic length of L is given by L by u infinity. Right. So, we are talking about advection of a particle under the influence of free stream u infinity and we are concerned with the time scale for that advection. So, that time scale is nothing by L by u, nothing but L by u infinity. So, advection driven problems would therefore, have L by u infinity as a suitable time scale for non-dimensionalization. While, when the Reynolds number becomes very small, let us say in creeping flows, which have Reynolds number well below 1. So, in that case, diffusion dominates, because 1 by R e becomes a significantly large term and then diffusion becomes as dominant as advection or most often much more dominant than advection. And then L square by nu infinity is the new uh, you know, suitable time scale 
it is a more appropriate time scale for non dimensionalizing time. So, you can check for yourself that L square by nu infinity, nu infinity is nothing but mu by rho infinity that is right. Uh, so, mu infinity by rho infinity. So, that is nu infinity right. So, check for yourself that L square by nu infinity will give you a time scale and if you use that to non, non dimensionalize your time then that is a more appropriate way of non dimensionalizing for diffusion dominant problems. And if you have a diffusion dominant problem then the, the momentum equation could then be slightly differently represented. Uh, for, so, for diffusion dominated problems uh, the momentum equation may be actually represented the way we have shown at the bottom of the slide. So, these are uh, few things which you can check for yourself in your spare time. When we attempt numerical solution of time dependent Navier-Stokes equations, there are many choices to make. How do we choose the grid points where the various discrete approximations are to be stored? That means, are we going to save velocities and pressures all at one point say at the cell centered uh, location. So, then we have either a cell centered or co-located arrangement that means, all the variables are being located at the same points that leads to co-location. While we may spread them around and distribute them in different points of the grid and locate them in such a manner because there are accompanying advantages by doing so. Then we have what is called as the staggered grid arrangement. So, there could be ways in which we can save or store the different variables. There are different ways by which we can integrate the velocity field because there is a time dependent term and therefore, you can discretize the time dependent term in different ways by using different numerical approximations. There are different numerical schemes by which you can discretize advection and diffusion or viscous terms. And of course, there are ways in which you try to derive a pressure equation by means of which you uh, first of all you have a pressure velocity coupling and uh, that would also ensure that you impose the incompressibility condition. Now, in incompressible flows we know that pressure changes are not linked with density changes hmm. and density here is not explicitly seen in the equations as well. All right, So, we have to have one thing ensured that pressure and velocity talk to each other in a consistent manner. So, that mass conservation and momentum conservation goes hand in hand. Therefore, a so suitable pressure equation may have to be brought in suitably for uh, the different formulations we will talk about. And then again we have to learn how to impose boundary conditions, how they are implemented in uh, viscous problems which are handled using Navier-Stokes equations. We will continue our discussion on incompressible Navier-Stokes equations in the subsequent lectures. Thank you.